first of all, hello, you guys. <laughs> but welcome. I have, really I have no manners. That's the first thing you need to know about me. <laughs> but uh, I was just uh, did the Harvard Medical School School Mental Health Conference <laughs> with um, 400 educators. And in the middle of it, as I'm talking about school avoidance, the alarm goes off. <laughs> and <clears throat> it says, you can leave the room or not leave the room. We'll let you know if it's an emergency. Um, so the fact that you sat, th stayed through that talk, I really appreciate. And we're not going to have any alarms today. But uh, just to give you a little bit of my background, I've worked for 23 years at a school-based health center um, and worked as a child psychiatrist there. That's my background. So I love working with teenagers and families. It's something very meaningful to me. And I also have done what are called safety assessments on kids. Some people like to call them threat assessments. And that's when a, it's probably why educators do love me because I help them figure out like, how do we keep a school safe? And how do we intervene with kids to give them a safety net? So that's, um, part of my background. And then another piece of my background that I wanted to share on a personal level, what you're looking at is um, my family. I was the youngest of six children in that picture. Um, I'm the little baby there sitting with my grandmother. I'm a new grandmother, just of four months. Uh, and um, that's my mother in the middle, my father on the right. And um, my... Uh, Mother died by suicide when I was four years old. So um, if I can help any family not suffer that kind of loss, that's um, something I really find great meaning uh, with that. And um, because your parents, you can appreciate, I actually wrote a book um, called In Her Wake, A Child Psychiatrist Explores the Mystery of Her Mother's Suicide. And I started writing it when my uh, first child, who's now 32, um, I was sort of trying to figure out, like, how do I make sense of losing a parent at four years old? And there's a concept called ghosts in the nursery, and it's the idea that you, um, you figure out what's gone on in your own childhood so you can be available to your kids. And so I always sort of think of this as an extended, um, uh, another term they talk about is adult detachment interview. And it's pretty remarkable. You can ask... Um, somebody who's pregnant with a child and the partner about what their life is like. And if they give you a story that's very, dis very much doesn't match, that the emotion doesn't match the, the, the words. So you say something like, you know, my father was a raging alcoholic, but you say it in this very monotone way, that can actually predict the attachment. You, you can, you can um, control for all the other factors, socioeconomic status, that kind of thing, and it can predict the relationship of your, um, you and your unborn child. So that's not meant to scare us. It certainly didn't scare me. It was more this idea that uh, building a, ma an, a meaningful narrative, being able to tell your story is really a critical component. And it's a critical component of us as parents. So um, anyway, that's my, uh, and I would say any time when you have a teenager, or an adult for that matter, that's suicidal, you feel like you're in a roller coaster. And it's the first thing you have to do is get yourself grounded. I mean, just for me in the last two days, I heard just as I was asking briefly that there's some people who've, been, who've had um, kids who might be exposed to college suicide. But in the last two days, I had you know, a family call me and say, you know, my, my uh, teenager did a Tylenol overdose, they're in the emergency room, what do we need to do? And, you know, I was, you, you just sort of, you have to just take a moment, get, take stock. And so that's really what I'm hoping that we can do together today is give you some information that just helps you feel a little bit ready to weather a storm if you confront it. And if you don't confront it, that's great. But maybe you have a friend that calls you and says, hey, I'm really worried. And you'll be able to sort of think you're just spending the night with a child psychiatrist who's been working for 24 years <laughs> with kids. And, um, so, and I've also had the luxury of teaching a, a Harvard freshman seminar for the last 15 years. So I get to balance both things and I teach psychiatry and memoir um, to some really exciting uh, students. But, so what we're gonna talk about today, we're gonna recognize depression 
in kids and teens, how to problem solve with your child or friend of a child, how to work with the school. Vacation, validation in family is the best medicine, and that's a deep belief I have. Uh, is you know, Yes, I'm a child psychiatrist, but now the way that I practice is I actually say to families, if we're going to start a medication, I want to meet with you all for eight visits um, while we are figuring out if the meds kick in. Because I, um, and I'll get to why I think that, but it's a deeply held belief. So recognizing depression in kids and teens, you know, what, what um, kids in schools, what you often see is, and, um, is some, and sometimes you'll, a school may pick up on it earlier than a parent does. You'll see dropping grades, um, you know, sometimes defiance, sulking, uh, variable academic performance. You know, in some of the public schools that I've worked with, there's been stealing that's gone on, and that might be the first way that uh, depression presents. There's a Winnicott, he's a psychoanalyst out of England, and he talks about, you know, stealing the love you think you deserve. So sometimes that might be this sort of oppositional way as a form of protest. And lack of motivation and tardiness. And I noticed as I came into the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> into the school, you know, you're always looking for sort of like tips about what the school climate is. And I'm first, first of all, you all, this is a very fancy high school. <laughs> I don't know when you renovated it, but it's looking really swank when you walk in. Um, but I did notice that it sort of said, if you're tardy, you need to go talk to the person on the left when you first walk in. And I was praying um, that the person who's on the left, who's the one that you have to go to the tardy, is got like a Mary Poppins kind of attitude. I don't, and I'm not, I don't, not cast in shade, but that can often be the first, you know, the gateway into whether a kid is going to just kind of give up for being tardy and kind of come in with a surly mood or feel like, okay, you know, I can. She is. She's, she's Mary you Poppins. Describe her to a yeah. That's that. That's awesome. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, so, I mean, the 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 numbers are somewhat terrifying. Although I do not want you to leave here feeling terrified. I beg you not to, because I deeply believe that depression and anxiety in kids is a treatable illness. That's where my passion is for the work that I do. And probably once or twice a year, I have a situation where I feel like, okay, this may be someone who didn't kill themselves because they got the kind of support that they need. So you all are ambassadors. I'm asking you to listen to this in that context. So, and that's the bottom line. More than 80% of teens improve with a combination of thera therapy and medication. And even though I'm a child psychiatrist who prescribes medications, I'm very... You basically have to twist my arm to get me to prescribe medications. I, you know, I'm from Cambridge, maybe that says it all, but um, I really feel like medications are when you have a suicidal, um, someone who's really, well, first of all, family history of, of um, major depression or some kind of mental illness, and um, who is really, really struggling to function. But I think we are definitely a country that's over-medicating our kids and taking shortcuts and that there are substantive things that we can do, particularly as a community, <coughs> to support our kids that can make kids feel more hopeful and combat the kind of isolation. So I'm not like cavalier about giving medicines. And, um, and there's actually an exciting study that just came out about two weeks ago looking at um, Effexor, which is a type of antidepressant and meditation. And it was in adults, but it showed that it's comparable. The, um, effect of doing, you know, um, daily meditation and effects are, which I think is fascinating. I still think there are times when I have seen medications be a turning point for a kid, but I do a waiting game sometimes. Sometimes I have kids who will um, really don't want medicines, and sometimes it might be because they have a family member that's taken medicine and they don't want to feel like they might, that, that that's going to be part of their identity. And I wait them out until they're really at a place where they're ready to see, is this going to help? And I always present it as a trial, you know. So um, we all know what happens. It's not good news if kids don't get treated for depression. Um, and one thing that's important is that kids are who are under 12 years old, and it gets complicated, of course, if you've had trauma, but 25% of kids who present with um, 
depression that's under 12 years old go on to have bipolar disorder. So it's just an important thing to keep an eye out for, particularly if you have a family history of bipolar. Um, I've had, uh, well, I mean, in my history of having done safety assessments, I remember doing a um, safety assessment on a kindergartner who was super aggressive and was um, having sort of hypersexualized behavior, stripping down, walking down the, the, um, the kind of, uh, in the middle of the classroom, just very, and, and actually had DC, when I teach to educators, they had DCSF got called because there was a worry about abuse. But, it, but when I did the safety assessment, what came out was that this was a family history of bipolar, and it was an early, early onset of bipolar. So it's just something to have in the back of your mind. So a child with a depressed patient is two to four times more likely to um, develop depression before adulthood. Uh, what I think is really important about this is um, context. And many times when I, uh, after I'd written my memoir, there would, I wrote a lot about the idea that when the headlines come out, say about a parent who's died by suicide, they'll say that children of parents who've died by suicide are two to four times more likely to die by suicide. But what they don't say is the small numbers that they're talking about. You're talking about eight to, oh gosh, hold on, I've got the exact, it's eight to 10,000 and it's, <coughs> And the increased rate is 12 to 10,000. So it's a, yes, it's an increased risk. And the reason I think that's important is, again, if you have family members who have um, mental illness, we do a disservice to our kids if we don't um, give them, which you're already doing because you're here, but we don't let them know how depression may show up in their life. Because Sometimes what I've had happen is that kids think that they're crazy they're, and they're private about it because they haven't really been informed about how symptoms can, can present. And schools, and I, I'm, I apologize, I didn't talk to, to you before to know what, what Winchester is doing, but schools have really embraced this and they've tried to, um, to give information in school settings around how depression may present. Um, they've eliminated, thankfully, not bringing people into big, huge auditoriums and giving them sort of a pep talk about staying alive, which actually can lead to contagion and be triggering. Um, but that concept of being able to, sort of like if you had a family member who had asthma or cancer, that you give that information. Because sometimes I've had kids come to see me and they never knew. They went, you know, maybe the first time that the family realized that they were depressed was because of a suicide attempt and they didn't know that there was a family history of depression in the family. So it's, it's something helpful to sort of give as like health data, you know. Um, there's a guy named Bill, well, that's, that's, never mind, I edited that. Um, uh, well, yeah, okay. So how does, how does depression present in teenagers and kids? I always say that the, when I'm talking to kids, the main thing I talk about is function. And like, if you're having trouble functioning, that's what we want to think about. So you look at, this is like a mnemonic that docs use in sort of being able to um, ask questions in a sequential way. It's called the Siggy Caps. And um, the change in sleep pattern, how many of you all have teenagers? Ha, oh, okay. <laughs> all right. If you go, and I, I mean, I worked at a teen health center for 23 years. I mean, sometimes from the spring to the following fall, a kid grows this much, right? So that's a lot. You need a lot of sleep to grow this much. So it's, a lot of times parents will say, well, how do I know when a kid is sleeping too much? And for me, it's really when you get into the struggles of the tardiness. You know, when you have, like, kids do catch up sleep, and sometimes they're going to sleep till... Um, two in the afternoon, it doesn't mean that they're, they're depressed, but it's when you're, you're in like knockdown, drag downs to get them to school, you're putting on three alarms, you cannot get them to um, move. The decreased interest, that one, usually the way I find out about it is that peers will tell me that they've seen a change. So that somebody who was, I just had a kid that I was talking to who was feeling de depressed and it was like Minecraft was, is her, her like, um, her lifeline, basically, and she'd gotten 
just apathetic about Minecraft. So it's it's the shift in something that might have been, you know, a lot of love for that. And um, decreased energy, you can see it sometimes. It's like a psychomotor retardation with not moving. And poor concentration, the one that's a little tricky about that, especially in girls, is that there's a lot of girls that have ADD that doesn't get picked up until right around ninth grade because um, they... Uh, they compensate, they're kind of quiet, they don't make, they're not hype, don't tend to be hyper. So the way you differentiate the concentration around a depression is that um, it's much earlier, hopefully, that you, when you go back with a, with a more alert mind, you'll see that the ADD had cropped out. There'll be family members that had ADD. And learning disorders is another place that can get, that can kind of emerge later. And it's really important to think about in the context of it. Um, and perseveration is that way a kid can just get in a rut and go over and over and over and over something that might be like a minor insult, and it just doesn't go away, and suicidal ideation's clear. Um, any questions about that part? I just raced through it, but, um, uh, you know, if someone doesn't get treatment, and <laughs> right now getting treatment is a major um, hurdle. You know, we have huge weights in ER, um, and getting a psychiatrist is really tough. I probably get two to three requests a day from um, people asking to be seen, and um, so it's a little bit grisly out there, and we're going to have to get more creative about our models, I think, to um, be able to support our, our, our um, teenagers. Um, you know, it can be, in a clinical sa sample, it's eight months. Um, that's a long year. You know, that's a soft sophomore year in, in high school. Um, but if you don't get treatment, oftentimes kids' depression will, after eight months, you know, go into remission. So just, um, and... Um, Again, you all are here, so I'm t preaching to the choir, but sometimes um, people can get in struggles with their teenagers and think that a kid is being manipulative when they're saying that they're suicidal, and that's, you know, clearly asking, if you're worried about your kid and asking them if they feel suicidal, it's not, it's not planting the idea in their head, it's, and it often can be a life-saving question. So uh, I would encourage, if you ever have a concern, you know, asking about it. Um, and means matters, that's actually through the Harvard School of Public Health. They have a, um, a site, and it's basically saying a lot of times when someone dies by suicide, we ask why, why, why? But it's really also what, and that, um, you know, 60% of suicide are with guns. And so if you have a teenager who can get, and you have a gun in your home, you're, you're uh, twice as likely to have your child die by suicide. So anybody that, you know, sometimes you might not, um, you might think that you have the gun in a safe place. And um, just like you may be able to remember about drinking at home and when your parents thought that you didn't know where, how to get the drinks, you can sort of imagine that there have been times that kids get access. So that's something always when um, ever anybody sees it, a clinician and you have a suicidal person, that's something that people will really ask about. And um, unfortunately, because of the kind of job I do, there can be, you know, fairly uh, brutal kinds of stories that happen where there's a, you know, a gun from a relative that was up in the attic that you kind of forgot about and then, you know, it's found out afterwards what it is. So it's just a... Uh, um, yeah. I feel so, like, I can't believe how dedicated you guys are that it's Tuesday night first week of February, and I'm telling you this very, uh, um, so, uh, that's the sobering fact, right? Suicide's the second leading cause of, um, okay. This is actually more when I teach, um, residents, because I've been teaching child psychiatry fellows and adult residents for a long, long time. This is something really important to think about, and I always teach them because it can get missed. So there's a guy named Jobes who looks at sort of the suicidal um, vulnerabilities in kids. And one that, that uh, is really important to pay attention to is agitation. 
So if you have a really, really restless teenager who's also suicidal, that's that combination of agitation and suicidal ideation is something that, um, and uh, self-hate. There's actually a site, selfcompassion.org, and there's a woman who's done research, Neff. Now, you could ask me, and certainly we're going to have time for questions, I hope, um, how do you tell self-hate in a teenager, because teenagers can be so tough on themselves. But it, again, it has that sort of perseverative, relentless quality to it. Um, uh, Neff's research, she actually has like six-minute um, compassion like meditations on her tape, but it's been shown that that is as, as effective as cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, when I work with, with teenagers in one of the sort of DBT dialectical behavioral therapy models that we'll talk about more is about really helping your kids figure out how do they do put-ups, how do they do positive statements for themselves, how do they, you know, really bolster their confidence. And, um, uh, and psychological pain what I would say when we get later is really just being able to sit with kids in the darkness and be with them really can mitigate a lot of that psychological pain. What I'm always, I was just talking to a wonderful um, student right before I got here, and um, she's really brave. She's trying to be a musician, and that's so brutal, and trying to navigate it and um, turn to gender, and they, you know, they just need to be able to talk about how tough it is to be in that creative world and to be disappointed by people. And it is so hard not to want to fix it. That's so much, many times, what we move into as parents. I know, myself, I have three young kids. Um, well, no, not three, three grown kids. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, okay. Um, this is a startling statistic to me that 15 to 20 percent of teenagers do some kind of self-injury. Um, that's you know one out of five. And um, what there's a guy named Barry Walsh. I don't know if you've ever heard him talk, but he does a lot about um, uh, cutting. And there <coughs> is two two thoughts. One is that sometimes when kids cut, um, it's because of, of not having developed distress tolerance, and sometimes it's also with kids who have trauma, and that then they cut, it actually gives them sort of an adrenaline jolt and helps them kind of integrate in a, in a way. And what the push in when you're doing therapy is to try to help them learn distress tolerance skills that won't hurt themselves, but actually uh, um, make them be able to tolerate the distress. And, um, I don't know, does Winchester have a, um, a cutting policy here? Yes. Can you tell you them? Kids have cut and, you know, clinicians are supposed to bring them down to the nurse and they'll assess for safety, physical safety, teach them how to clean their wounds. Yep. Um, we're supposed to call parents, but that doesn't happen every time. Okay. We can with the parents. To go see a clinician? Or? To see a clinician. Yeah. Here. Okay. We have lots of clinicians. Here. Yeah. Got it. So, I mean, some of the things that Barry Walsh talks about, and I, that's why I was curious about the protocol, is about also having people, if they've cut themselves, the expectation in, within the school is that they're wearing something that covers it so it doesn't trigger other kids. Mm -hmm. I, um, I don't know if that's a policy that happens here. Not 100% no. Okay. So, so, so this is just a little tweet to let you all know <laughs> if you're on a wellness committee. It's a, it's a, it, if you don't have things written down, then it's hard to sometimes ask for those things to happen. But, but the movement has been, it used to be that whenever anybody cut, they got sent to an emergency room. And sometimes that made things worse because you ended up sort of having people escape whatever activity they didn't want to do or whatever distress they were feeling, and you reinforced it. So now the, the effort is to... If, if they are getting support outside and with a clinician or with someone within the school that's helping them with building the, the distress tolerance, that you assess it, you figure out whether they're suicidal or not, but you don't treat it as if they're definitely suicidal. It's, um, you, uh, even though we know that sometimes when people cut, they can go on to kill themselves. So you're sort of trying to make that differential. Um, so... Um, 
So that was me just going through the protocol. You want to be non-judgmental. You want to have a school point person, which it sounds like you have the nurse and the counseling staff, and um, limit social contagion. And um, okay, so many times parents will ask, "Well, why do kids cut themselves?" And it's to decrease intense emotional pain. And so the objective is, how do you help them increase their distress tolerance? And um, there is a uh, MAZA, someone was asking me about res resources. There's a good YouTube, both for schools and for parents, on DBT skills. So uh, dialectal behavioral therapy means two seemingly opposing things exist at the same time, which of course for adolescents is super hard to hold on to. So you can hate someone and you can love them. That would be a dialectal. And Marsha Linehan was the woman who developed it and actually had some uh, borderline characteristics herself when she was 16 and did cutting and various things. And she developed this out of, and it draws a lot on um, meditation and um, building a skill set. Uh, she uh, has renamed meditation mindfulness because that it has less of the sort of, I don't know, spiritual side of it, uh, but that's a cornerstone is, is learning some mindfulness. And then it's the land of acronyms. But some of the acronyms are worth you all learning. Um, uh, there's one called TIP, which is like if a teenager is really gonna lose it. So I'm just gonna give you a couple from my practice that I like that I would pass to you all. Um, TIP is uh, temperature change. So um, so this is for when you're have a really escalated teenager, and they just are beside themselves. And I say this with a lot of love for teenagers, but I've been with them sometimes, and they're short-circuiting. Um, if you tell them before they hit this kind of overloaded spot, um, changing the temperature can really help. And so getting cold, cold water. Now, I have told this to teenagers, and I find out all sorts of things. Like I had this one, uh, student I was telling them about that, and they talked about how when they were at camp, when they started out their morning routine, they used to have to jump off a wharf into freezing cold water. But that's a, it, it changes the mood um, by cold, cold water. So um, that's the T, that's what the T stands for. The I is for intense exercise. So that's, it, oh, just to give you another really touching example, um, a student of mine, um, had had a parent die, was really devastated by it, remembered what I had said, and then like was at the, I'm trying to keep it confidential, was at the grandmother's near a lake and sort of jumped into the cold water just to kind of get themselves recalibrated. So they tuck away sometimes this idea of like changing the temperature as being a way of like when you're completely overloaded and your ability to go through some of these acronyms doesn't work. And I is for intense exercise, and then P is for paired breathing, and then there's um, progressive muscle relaxation. So those are the kinds of things that develop sort of that are in the moment of being flooded. The other um, DBT one that I love is called opposite action. And that's the idea that when you want to say like smash something, you do the opposite of it, which sounds really easy, but trying to um, introducing that idea is, is something. So it's also sort of saying like, we know with anxiety that there's an intense desire to avoid the activity and that actually doing the opposite action of that is the one way that you can push through it. So just beginning to have a shared language of being able to talk about it. Um, but there's all, again, if you go on, if you look at the, uh, the DBT Maza YouTube, the parent um, section of it, they have it both for schools and then for parents, a bunch of YouTube lessons sort of explaining the, um, the acronyms uh, that, and, the, and some of them are the things that your grandmother probably told you. There's like please, which is about the idea of making sure you have physical, um, that you take care of your physical body, that you sleep, that you eat well. <laughs> but they put it into an acronym. Uh, so, uh, okay. So we have till um, 8.30, right? Yeah, whatever, okay, you t all tell me. Um, so, the next thing I was gonna do was just tell you briefly how to problem solve with your kid. And I'm gonna give you a couple of things that I 
think they're helpful. Um, I wrote a book called The Behavior Code, which was mostly for kindergarten through eighth educators. It's the weirdest thing. You know, I wrote this heart-wrenching book, this memoir. It took me about 15 years to write. And I feel really proud of it. I think it has. I, I know I've had people tell me that it's helped them realize that their life is important, and that's why I wrote it, is I wanted for those people who had lost someone to suicide to remind people who are suicidal that they'll be missed. That was the, the um, because Tom Joyner talks about when people die by suicide, they often perceive themselves as a burden, and the important part is the perceived part. And I can tell you from having worked 23 years with families who've lost someone to suicide that um, they all wish that they could have said something that the burden that that, that it was the, the perceived it wasn't that they were a burden i mean um so uh anyway that that was total digression back to the behavior code so the behavior code was written um because i had worked and i realized there was a gap we lo we are losing Every one of you, I would ask you, if there's any teacher, you just say thank you, thank you for staying in the business. We are so grateful to you, because it is brutal right now, especially during the pandemic. And um, so I, I was really concerned we're losing 25% of our teachers in the first five years. They leave it. And partly it's because they're not getting the training about what happens when you get in the trenches and you have escalated kids. So. I wrote it for parent. I wrote it also secretly for parents because I wanted the parents to know how to advocate for what kind of things they should ask for in the schools if they had anxious kids, opposition. And I used language that was uh, oppositional. I don't really believe in oppositional. But this, there's a whole, you know, if you ever have a kid that's escalated, we always say they're oppositional, and we give them a thing called oppositional defiant disorder. And I actually think a lot of it is around the conflict in that part of. The failure in schools is we don't figure out how to drop the rope. And so I use, anyway, so the categories I talk about are oppositional, kids with sexualized behavior, and kids anxious or depressed. And I had, and so I'm sort of digressing a little bit from teen depression, but it's, I think, is important. Um, this is more, uh, so I had these sort of SOS tips that I started out the behavior code with, but I think they can make sense if we think you know misbehavior is a symptom you know sometimes what happens is that um depending what culture you're from that's not actually something that people latch on to uh this book was translated in poland and i was told a lot by people i did a tour in poland and people said like we lived in a communist country and so we learned like to hide behavior and to keep our kids from showing something that could potentially get us in trouble. So the idea that misbehavior is trying to communicate something and it's a symptom, isn't, oh, that's, a, that's an American white kind of idea. But, um, and then the idea that behavior is communication, um, it makes it kind of fun when you see your teenager doing something, trying to figure out what are they trying to tell me? And you get yourself into sort of more of a detective then, you know, um, and get really curious about it. And this one, I think, is really important. The only behavior you control is your own. Um, there's a Yiddish saying, you can't control the wind, but you can control the sails. And um, so that goes back to that whole idea of, you know, whatever practice you all have to keep yourself grounded, whether it's exercise, yoga, meditation, that are... A lot of how we deliver whatever it is that we have to say is super key. You all may think that your teenagers don't give a shit about you. Sorry, I, I, is, are, how old are people that are listening to this? Um, never mind. Okay, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> but the reality is um, I've spent hours and hours listening, even when a teenager is estranged from a parent. They spend hours and hours talking about um, about about their parents, and um, so just staying centered is really. And the behavior can be changed. The reason I put that up is I remember once I was talking to a group of parents, and I was talking about Seligman's work, and Seligman is sort of the granddaddy of positive psychology, and um, <clears throat> he talks uh, about when you get depressed, 
it's because you think something is permanent and pervasive. And really holding on to the temporary nature of where your child might be, it's really, inter- it's really easy to kind of, or not easy, but it happens, where you can slip into catastrophic thinking and think this is, you know, what, that you have a future ball and you can predict what's happening. And that, to me, is the excruciating part about being a parent of a teenager because there's a little bit of chaos theory. You know, you're not, um, you're, not, you're not able to cocoon them as much. And there are things that there's sort of these deviations off the path. You can't control whether maybe it, they make a best friend in this library and that's what makes things so much easier for the last two years of their college or you know, last two years of high school. And that whole sort of... Um, but, but holding on to the idea that, that whatever seems like it's permanent... I mean, I remember my um, son, who's now like 30... When he was in ninth grade, I, I thought, you know, he must have a learning, learning disorder and he's never going to... I mean, he was just monosyllabic. That was just who he was. And, you know, he's, he's doing really good now. So um, uh, another thing I would share that I talk about with teachers, I once um, did this really beautiful presentation to a residential of... Um, it was a free residential for traumatized kids. And the... Um, the, one of the teachers was saying, like, I know that this kid is a, a porcupine, but I just think of him like a baby porcupine. And, you know, I think that sometimes kids can be really prickly. We all can be prickly. But um, I like this model that Dan Hughes talks about. And he is a psychologist, and he talks about the PACE model. And um, I think it's a good thing to think about together um, the PACE stands for pause. A lot of times we get into big trouble because we don't pause, especially when we're pissed off. So our kid comes home drunk and we are going to ground them for, you know, for the next 10 years. Or, you know, we just we get into authority struggle and we find ourselves kind of hitting the accelerator in terms of consequences and really pausing and knowing you have t- time. You can revisit something. Um, there's also the idea of being playful. A lot of times, um, especially from kids who've had abuse, is they provoke to control. And so pausing and also getting playful, and there's a fine line between playful and shaming, but say a kid says to you, you know, I'm, I'm just going to fail school and I'm going to, you know, whatever, whatever, and just kind of rolling with it a little bit, I think, you know, this, we're all very serious after two years of the pandemic. I think <laughs> some of us, have, we've lost a little bit of our humor and just staying a, a little bit loose, I think is really important. And then the A is for, um, <coughs> uh, is for accepting. And what the accepting is about is, and this is really cool when you see teachers catch on to this. It's around accepting the feelings and not the actions. So a lot of times people will get into debate around the feelings that a kid has and you're not probably going to convince them out of whatever feeling that is. They're just going to get more entrenched. So if you are able to kind of stay with that and then set the limit around whatever the action is that you really might not agree with. And C is curious. Now curious is a really hard one, but it does work to kind of ask to stay asking questions versus getting into kind of um, lecturing or telling someone all the reasons why they shouldn't hate themselves, but really trying to say, so, you know, trying to explore it, uh, which is easier said than done, and empathic is sort of self-evident. Um, okay, I talked about shortage of size. Just want to see. We've been talking for 45 minutes. Okay, that's a long time. Um, <laughs> Let's just open it up for questions first, and then I can always go back to my slides. But it's late. Any thoughts or questions that folks had? Yes? Yeah, I had a question earlier on when you were talking about the signs of depression. Yeah. And, um, and you mentioned it a little bit. I mean, if we're talking about teenagers, mm-hmm. there's, um, I don't know if it's a cliche, but teenagers are difficult. Teenagers are mm-hmm. moody. Teenagers are this. Yeah. And I, I kind of feel like sometimes if I'm 
raising a concern, I hear, well, that's just typical. Mm. How when you're raising it to your child or you're raising it to someone else? To someone else. Okay. Um, Even to a school. Mm. Yeah. I, I know schools are in a position where they see a lot of kids. Yeah. And they may, you know, they have yep. kind of... Compared numbers. to other people who might not have the same level of support. It, you know, the time when that gets really tricky in schools, and I say that having worked with schools for, you know, so many years, um, they're limited resources, right? And so I always say to parents, um, even though you all invited me, thank you very much, Dot. <laughs> You're not here to win a popularity contest. Raise hell, you know, because people really do get the attention of the ones who, like, you seem like a very nice person, but sometimes you, you're not, not you know, I, I almost lost my job one time because I had a, a kid who was depressed, but they were, get, they were getting, they'd gone from Bs to Cs, but they were really depressed. There was, like, psychomotor retardation, and it was, they were not, a, they, they weren't functioning at the level that they could, and I told the mom to go down to the director of special ed office and just sit there until she could see the director of special ed because the certain psychologist was just dropping the ball and was roadblocking it. And the director of special ed called me. She was so mad at me. But I sort of feel like, you know, sometimes you do have to really um, rattle the case, you know, depending on what you want. But particularly, you know, around advocating, say, if you have someone who's a perfectionist, let's just take that for an example. And maybe what they, they're, they're getting super stuck and they need a very specific kind of help to help them get unstuck. Of being able to ask those, like, how do you as a school address perfectionism? Do you have a scale that you use? You know, um, is, is, is there someone that can help you thinking about how you, that kind of thing. So, um, and, you know, I, I do think though it's probably important to, sometimes, I'm trying to say this without being blaming, but sometimes it can get into a blame game. I, I just did a talk on school avoidance, and sometimes what can happen with school avoidance is that the parents feel like if you guys would just do your job, then this kid would get to school, and then the school feels like if you just did your job. So, you know, I, I often, when I've done safety assessments, it's around trying to broker sort of entrenched positions between the school and the parents. and and sort of take the higher goal. But as concrete as you can be about why you're concerned, I think is really important um, in helping the school understand it. Because they may not see it. I mean, like I know with bipolar kids, sometimes what happens over the years, and I, I use bipolar very rigorously. There was a real epidemic back in the 90s and it was a travesty. But you would have kids who kept it together in school and then would completely trash when they got home. And so that divide of, do, and it really sometimes it's so dependent on who the special ed director is and how, whether they, you know, you like I could tell you all sorts of places you can duel. Another place you can really have duels with schools is around substance use. And what we know mostly is that substance abuse happens to, Two years before substance abuse, usually there's a um, mental illness, usually depression, um, sometimes ADD. And, but schools will get into pissing contests because they'll say, no, the primary thing is substance abuse. I don't know how they figured that out. But, and so we're not going to give services because this is substance abuse and special ed doesn't cover that. So yeah, there's a lot of navigating and negotiating, but thank you for that question. Yes? Yeah, you said something about distress tolerance skills. Mm. Mm like a set of skills that I can use in the classroom if I have a student that's distressed. What would be like your top like five strategies or okay. like, what are some things that I could throw like, out in the moment? Yes. Okay, let me think. Hold on. Um, good. So what grades, first of all? High school? I teach all high school. Uh, okay, great. So it's not K through eight. So I was going to say, okay. Um, I'm going to save that question. I'm going to have a really fast answer the next time, but I have to take a minute to think about what I would say, my top five. Okay, just like for um, parents, I was really struck by this because, you know, the dialectical behavioral therapy manual that Alec Miller made and Maza made, which are those two folks made, there's like all these different kind of acronyms you've got. 
the single most helpful thing of helping with suicidal kids is validation. So I will put that as number one that you do. So role model to me how a piss and vinegar kid might come in stressed out, and I'll, and I'll just try to see if I can do a validation back. Uh, a lot of times they might come in uh, ranting and raving, like, this one teacher, she absolutely hates me. Like, I need you to talk to them. I got a 60 on this test, and nobody's helping me. And Great. Now I'm going to fail, and it's this. OK, so hold on. So, so what, I, what I'd say first is oh, I would meet the affect with the affect. So even though I know that they, you know, time on learning, you got to be learning in like 33 seconds, I still would say, it looks like you are, I would reflect, I would reflect back with the, it looks like you are so pissed. Like, and, and I would just, you know, and that you feel like your life is over because of the, t so I'd let them know that it landed because if I tried to convince them, like actually you're an A minus student that probably isn't going to, you know, you're good to go, they're going to escalate it. To, to, because they're going to think she doesn't get it and I need to ramp it up and show her how stressed I am. So I want to I wanna immediately try to, try to let it land on me, you know. Um, and then, you know, I, I think even if, it's, even if it's not a stressed out kid like that, I think doing any kind of building into the school, what, what subject do you teach? Okay, great. Then that's even easier. Building into the English cult culture that before we do that, we're going to do like a three-minute grounding thing. And you can have different kids take practice on that. And there's like Chris Willard is, if you ever wanted to have a really good guy, Chris Willard does meditations, you know, mindfulness stuff. And he has all sorts of books for kids on it. Um, but you can have th simple things about... Because mindfulness is just about observation, so you could even have it be that kids pick out a song and they listen to the different lyric lyrics. You could have it be that they stand on their foot for a minute. Something that gets them into their bodies is uh, it would be the second. So validation, some kind of mindfulness thing, taking a look at is there. Um, so, in the younger kids, K through, you guys are okay if I transition into this for just three minutes. <laughs> um, in the younger kids, they have what are called, com uh, what we talk about in the behavior code are comfort boxes, but they're, you know, sort of boxes that you put various things in that can help you um, pull yourself together. But I think with high school kids, there's an app called Virtual Hope Box, which is, um, you know, a way of sort of collecting that they could do on their own. And I don't know what your phone policy he here is, but they're, you know, calming their, they could have a picture of someone that helped them to feel calm. You know, you could have that as sort of like the first um, five days that you bring people in for the first of the semester and have them build a virtual hope box that they could think about with how. Um, uh, just think of, those are three, I've got two more. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So sure, much. yeah. Um, no, English is a that's that's where everybody. Is. I can tell you're a great teacher, and that's when I mean you're here tonight, right? Um, but that's where lots of things come out, lots of things. Oh, one other thing though, I would tell you guys, I think would be great if the um, Winchester High School could adopt. It's called a million words. Look it up. It's really cool. And it, what you do is you have the kids write a letter about how they think their parents would describe them as a student. You see, one step removed. Then you ask the parents that they have a million words that they can describe about their kid. And, um, and it, it, if you look up a, a million words, or, or shoot me an email, um, I can g give you that. But I, I thought that was a really cool exercise, and they've got a whole bunch of stuff online about how that sort of opened up, and yeah. So those are quick ideas. Um, any other questions, thoughts? Yes. So I'm just curious, what is your definition of bipolar? Thank you. Okay. Um, well. <laughs> I know that's, that's... No, no. I mean, when I'm saying my definition, so there's a... You, you probably know this, but there's a thing called the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is the psychiatric... They say it's the Bible. I don't think it's the Bible. It's symptomatic mush. But it... it um, the 
key concepts about bipolar are um, rapid cycling, uh, where you, the moods go up and down um, quick, you know, in quick succession, um, where you have flight of ideas. So that's like, well, you could say it with me because I have a little bit of ADD, so I sort of went on that tangent. But it's it's really going from like um, we're in the library to bouncing off of the poster on women in World War II, so that's the flight of ideas. Um, sexualized behavior um, with, with, with a, often with a little bit of level of danger to it. And um, sleep, usually two to three to four hours of sleep. And then in those periods of mania, you wake up and you don't feel like you've missed any of that sleep. So that's another aspect of it. And sometimes there are psychotic meaning that your mind is playing tricks and you hear voices that can show up with bipolar and then suicidal ideation. So that's, that's the framework. What happened with kids is there was a guy who actually just died last week, but or two weeks ago, Joe Biederman out of Mass General, who kind of didn't talk about discrete mood episodes where you'd have you know elevated mood and then depressed mood, which is what the bipolar came from. Um, but Moore's talked about this sort of <coughs> chronic level of rapid, what he called rapid cycling, and it got all mixed up and didn't, it, it meant that we had a lot of kids that were on antipsychotics, which was a very strong kind of medication. Um, what I would say for adults is um, if someone is truly bipolar and they take lithium, they're eight times le less likely to die by suicide. So um, bipolar with medication is really important. And like schizophrenia for adults and bipolar, um, often there's a mind blindness, so it's very hard to appreciate that, um, that someone's having a manic episode. So, um, yeah, it's probably more than you wanted to know, but that's my Thank broad you. breaststroke. Yeah. The other thing I would say is if there is a family member that has bipolar, um, it's really helpful. There's a guy named Bill Beardsley who's uh, written a book called Out of the Darkness and has worked with families who have uh, um, parents who have major mental illness. And what's really important is that the kids feel like they can, um, they can have a trusted adult that if they notice something in their parent, they can tell them so that they, they can all support. Um, I have had a situation where I had a suicidal teenager, and um, this was one of those times when I um, had said, I'll, I'll give the antidepressant, but I want to be doing family therapy. And what was going on was that the, um, the mother was bipolar. It hadn't really been talked about in the family. And getting the mom to get the help totally settled the family down. So um, it's, it's I, I think that when a family member is struggling, it's a family crisis, and as much as we can get family cohesion, it's really key, really important. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. Any, yes? Um, I like this much better than PowerPointing you guys to death. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I came in a bit late, so you may have touched no, no worries. at the beginning, but um, can you talk about any connections between anxiety and depression, and also how do you differentiate in a teenager depression from just like everyday teenage angst, and so, I did touch on that a bit. Yeah, um, function would be what I'd say um, in terms of depression and everyday. I mean, it's hard to be a teenager, and it's really hard right now. I mean, especially with social media. Um, I think the studies are really showing a robust connection to, I mean, there are a lot of positive aspects of social media, but um, the idea of, con you know, Used to be when I was when I was growing up as as a child psychiatrist, Dave, uh, Elkin would talk about the imaginary audience. But now we have the real audience at all moments, and you know that can really be destructive for kids' sense of being able to appreciate who they are, because there's this sense of needing to be more than and being watched all the time. So that's really tough. Um, the difference, well. I mean, I think depression and anxiety sometimes overlap, and, and sometimes you have kids, uh, kids who are depressed and they're anxious. <laughs> um, you know, 
the, the, so the, I, I would think of anxiety as different kinds of anxiety. So you have anxiety that comes from trauma, and that might be showing up with hypervigilance or um, dissociation or um, avoiding things. So that's like one bucket of anxiety. And then you can have social anxiety, which is much more about... You know, I just was talking to a patient today who, um, you know, going into the classroom is just exhausting because uh, she's hyper aware of how other people are looking at her and gets shut down really easily and then gets into a vicious um, spiral with automatic negative thoughts. So that's another sort of bucket. Um, and then you can have, I'm um, just trying to think of the other kinds of, you know, generalized anxiety, which is just that, and often those are kids that sort of were anxious from the get-go and sort of started out anxious and it takes a tremendous amount of energy just to, you know, their set point is just alarm, you know. Um, but I think depression and anxiety both are helpful to, to have kids. Another thing I was going to say that you'd want to do in your classroom is have kids keep, um, be able to recognize the cognitive, the, what, some people like to call thinking traps, but are really cognitive distortions. So it's the idea of catastrophic thinking, just being able to label the thing, you know, catastrophic thinking, uh, future ball thinking, which is the idea that you can actually project into the future and you know what you're, I'm going to be homeless and I'm going to be, you know, this teacher, hate, the teacher hates me is such an interesting one. That is, I ran an advising program in a school from 1995 to to 2000 with 2000 kids and 200 teachers and the single most thing that kids would talk about that would torpedo their education is the teacher hates me. It's a and teachers often nice teachers like you really feel uncomfortable okay. talking about how a kid feels about another teacher. They feel like they're betraying the other teacher. I would argue just as a curbside I actually think kids learning how to manage that is really important because they're going to torpedo their education and sometimes they're doing things that are somewhat provocative and self and self-fulfilling. So, you know, it seems like an important learning experience for them even though it's not directly on learning about Lord of the Flies, you know, has relevance. So, um, did I answer your question? Oh, cognitive distortion, sorry. Automatic negative thoughts. Those are two things that show up both in depression and in anxiety. So I don't really, in that case, I mean, medications is important to figure <coughs> out about, like, are you depressed or are you anxious? Because you might give different medication. And it's also important because if, say, you have social anxiety, you're going to want to do some exposure therapy. So you're not going to want to protect the kid from doing anything that makes them anxious. And so that's really the work as a parent is how much can you tolerate their distress or how much do you come in to rescue or navigate and, and kind of pave the way so that they don't have the distress. So that's something where I was saying how important it is to be monitoring your own response and how much you can tolerate your kid being uncomfortable, which I will show you a quick, this is, this is my favorite picture of the whole thing. Where is it? Oh, God, it's all the way at the end. There, this one, which is about being in the darkness with your kid. That's the hardest thing to do. Most kids know if you can join them in the darkness, they'll figure out how to get to the other side. But it's really scary to do that as a parent. You know, um, I can't do this. I'm never going to be able to do this. This seems so hard to, you know, versus trying to kind of solve it for them. So, yeah. Sure. Any other questions, thoughts? Yeah. Um, so my youngest, has been in like intensive DBT therapy mm. at McLean 3E. Okay. The whole family's like learning all the, the acronyms. Of yeah. Everything. And I just I I want to tell everybody. Can you tell us, folks? Yes, please yeah, tell them some of the good acronyms. So just the validation. Yeah. Has been so. Oh, good. Um, Glad I wasn't lying. No. <laughs> not at all. But what I find so interesting is that like it kind of is in competition or like in opposition to what. I thought I was doing by being a cheerleader. For mm. So when they, really good. you know, like, so just like a recent example, like, mom, I'm freaking out about this volleyball tournament. I'm so nervous. I can't do it. I'm going to have a panic attack. But like, there's no way I can do it. Right. A previous mom before DBT would have been like, 
You can do it. I know you can do it. Mm. I've seen you working so hard on your mm. sermon. Like, you've got this. And, and now I'm like, of course. Like, that must, that sounds really scary. Like, you have to yeah. go out there in front of all those people. And, like, it's magic. It works yeah. so yeah. well. Yeah. It's, like, shocking. Yeah. Yes. Like, so it is shocking. It is. Like, yeah. I have a 67. Like, you said, like, that's okay. You're going to be fine. And, like, you, oh, man. Like, that must have really felt. Yeah, you've got it. You've got it. Yes, you must have been so disappointed. You worked so hard, and you didn't just—you didn't think you deserved it. You're not agreeing. The, the people often think that if they validate, they're agreeing, like that they're somehow accepting the emotion, which there, it's a big difference to just say, "This is hard for you," and I'm not going to try to talk you out of your feelings because those are your feelings. And if you get in a pissing contest with a teenager about their feelings, they're going to convince you why. You should get it, and you didn't get it. That's very cool. So I just, I feel like one of the most helpful things that I found is like the, the work around validation. And then the other thing I was just really... Thank you so much for sharing that with us, because that's what everyone's going to remember most about this talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but then the other thing I just wanted, I was really interested to hear about when you asked if Winchester had a cutting policy, because yeah. it didn't occur to me that Winchester would have a cutting policy. And so this is like more like a point or question to you know, all you find educators and dot people who are here, like, on the school side. Um, my daughter, who's in the DBT, her, her DBT group has a policy that you have to conceal mm -hmm. if that applies to you, like, anything. Yep. So I've seen it there. I, I didn't hear about it or see about it from Winchester, but I, I would urge the school, if possible, to have it not only be a policy that what, maybe you have to, but you're allowed to conceal because I have heard tendentially from parents who you know whose kids have like wanted to do a sport mm -hmm. they weren't allowed to wear like something that covered them under mm -hmm. their jersey mm -hmm. and that precluded them from participating in a sport and that that's just good information really heartbreaking yeah because for yeah. that kid probably participating in a sport yeah would, would be like helpful absolutely do. And, yeah and these are from parents from like a few years ago so I don't know if that's still a thing. Well, there's no written policy, but I've definitely. It be you know Barry Walsh has it, so you can get. I mean he he. I mean he has the recommendations, so you know it. It would be good to have it written down. Just yeah, we have a very informal. Um, hands off dress code. Mm. So like this year, since COVID has come back to school, kids almost seem to be showing off their scarves. Mm -hmm. so the little short mm. shirts and their bellies are just all cut up. Old wounds, but wounds. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I asked about, can't we have the kids covered up? Because it is triggering for other people. Mm -hmm. And it was like, we can't body shame them. Mm -hmm. Because for some kids, it's also a badge of pride. I've recovered from this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it's complicated, yeah. It's a mixed bag. And again, that was a year and a half ago that I asked the question. Well, my recommendation would be cover up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for what it's worth. <laughs> Any other questions? No. Yes. Yeah, of course. One of the flags on your prior page was, what do I do if my child refuses? Oh, yeah, let me go back to that. That's great. I'm so glad you fa read so fast. Um, <laughs> oh, wait a sec, where is it? Okay. Um, it must be the parent concerns. Yes. So it's this one of these? Yeah, the top right. Uh, <laughs> yes. So a couple things I'd say about it. Um, It's hard. Not all therapists are alike, you know, and the fit is smart. Um, I tell folks when I see them, if you really hate me the first time, you can fire me. Because I really want them to have a choice. I really feel like there's not much sense of agency now. Um, and I think it's a rent. So if a kid refuses to see someone, I, I, I have two, you know, there's a big thing about holding both, right? I have two, I hold both. On the one hand, I feel like I've been in situations where um, people have gotten into pissing contests with teenagers about seeing a therapist or taking meds, and I have said, if you force it, I can guarantee you that if a kid, once they're 18, if they're forced into taking medications, they will never take medications afterwards. So. I mean, this is a pretty graphic example, but I had one kid who was refusing to take meds. They were in a residential, and the um, 
they were docking penalties for her not having privileges in the residential. And it was medication I was prescribing. And I said, that can't happen. I'm prescribing the meds. You can give her consequences for the behavior she has because she's not on the medication, but not because she's not taking medication. And it turned out that there was abuse that was happening in the residential. And that was what, when you talk about behavior as communication, that was what was going on. And, it, and she was appropriately outraged with the misuse of po power, the abuse of power. And um, so, I, I, and I've been in front of a judge where a judge was saying that, you know, uh, wanted to have me testify around this kid needing to take meds. And I was like, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to support that. I think we have to figure out how there are consequences if they don't have, if she doesn't take her meds. So I feel that way. And I also feel like sometimes I think about it as modality. I have had situations where a kid has refused individual or been just a pain in the ass about be seeing me. Then I bring in the whole family, and there's something going on in the family that we really need to be talking about. And you see movement. So sometimes what a kid is saying is, I don't want to be the identified patient, because there's other things happening in this family, and that's what needs to be addressed. So I had a situation like that with a kid, now is much, much older and is a lawyer and doing great, but where this, I loved this girl, but she did not want to see me. She was not happy to see me. She was like, the problem's with my parents. And I was like, I don't know. I just know that you really aren't talking much. And so I brought the family in. And what was going on is that there was an affair going on in the family. And there was a lot of, that was more what was going on around her acting out was a deflection. So sometimes you have the identified patient who escalates to keep, they're sort of being like the sacrificial lamb in the family. So we have... I think in, in this area, we have an overemphasis on individual therapy. I've done a lot more now in the last you know, seven to eight years family therapy because I feel like it's really powerful and you move very quickly. Um, there's a theory that a wonderful guy, John Sargent, has about suicidality, and I think it's, um, there's a lot of credence to it. Um, his idea is that when you have a suicide attempt, it's either because the kid is trying to negotiate getting more separate from the family, or they're, they're trying to bring the family in. And when you operate from that lens, and there's a guy named Guy Diamond who's done a lot of research on this, um, on attachment-based family therapy, I really love that kind of therapy, and I think it, again, is faster than a lot of the, some of the therapy that um, we do like long, you know, long, long, long psychotherapy kind of thing because you're changing. What I want in a family is if you have a kid that's suicidal, that they turn to the parent. You know, what you want to know is why when your teenager was in a dark hour, they went in and took 10 Tylenol instead of coming to a parent and saying, I'm stressed. So I want to look at what was the rupture in the family and how can we repair it? And that's, I find that really exciting work, so... Any other questions? Yes. Thank you, you guys. This is so much more interesting to me than PowerPointing you guys. <laughs> I hope this isn't too specific, but have you ever noticed a, an age that's a specific trigger point for adopted children? Great question. Um, I'm trying to think of the... Um, the woman who is in Cambridge who specializes in it, I'm trying to channel her. I, it's a complicated answer, I'm going to say. Uh, I have an amazing um, patient that I'm treating uh, over the last four years that's adopted. And for, for her, it, so it's an N of one, but it gives an example of sort of adoption and how it can get complicated. She did fine at the very beginning, at the beginning of the trajectory of being adopted. So all the way through elementary school, untouchable. But she had um, both depression, ADHD, and perfectionism combined. And that made her feel less than. And feeling less than then made it feel also that I'm... I'm unlovable, and that hits a core issue of adoption. Many people who read my book would feel like if they, that they resonated with the idea that it could be an adoption story because you, you know, when you lose a parent, you, you can feel abandoned, 
and then think there's, you know, when you, especially when it's at a young age, I was four, and there's, whenever there's some kind of major trauma at younger ages, you, the, the logic of a young child is, goes from something bad happened to me to I must be bad. So that's, the, that's what I, I would, if I were to say, well, when does adopt, adop, you know, when can adoption rear its l ugly head? If some of the adoption came from the fact that, you know, either there was trauma, young ages, and then the, there's sort of a honeymoon that happens, and then you hit that period where maybe they also become vulnerable to either ADD or um, something bad happens, then there's, the resources can be, you know, there's not as much um, sometimes rootedness to get through it, and it becomes kind of, it can feel intractable. And that actually, when I talked about behavior can change, it came from a mom she was so relieved to think about it because she, she had an adopted child that was really struggling and she'd gotten into a place of thinking like, this may never change. And she realized that that had really, kind of, that, that was sort of catastrophic thinking that once she could recognize it, it kind of gave her a level of relief. So, so thank you. sure, yeah. Any other questions or thoughts? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just knew why would the course here. It's just a stage they will grow out of. It. Yeah. So can you explain a little bit more Sure. About that? So sometimes what you have is um, you have a school that might approach a parent and they'll say, you know, I'm really concerned because, you know, little Sammy is looking apathetic, doesn't participate in class, you know, or some, they'll, they'll describe it. And... The response of a parent, and it particularly comes oftentimes when parents may either feel ashamed or they're from a different culture where the idea of major depression wasn't really something recognized, so they'll feel like, you know what, he's just going to grow out of it. And, um, and sometimes it's true, you may grow out of it, but other times in the way that I'm talking about where, you know, a kid may have gone from being a straight A kid to a C minus kid you know, C minus eight, or the very, you know, lo loss of appetite in boys is something really to pay attention to unless they're in crew where there might be some weight restriction going on or wrestling where there's some, that's a, a real, that's not a stage. That's usually something's gone on where it's gone from mood to being in the body, what they call neurovegetative symptoms. So that, that's what that, um, one other thing I wanted to say about my ref teen refuses to see someone. This is I'm skipping ahead because I really don't want to do all these apps, all these things. But this one, um, that comes from the Adolescent Substance Abuse Program at Children's Hospital, and it's saying that parents, I see so sometimes parents they don't realize the leverage they have, and they give away all this stuff, and I'm like. Oh my God, what are you doing? You know, so a kid has access to a car, a credit card sometimes, um, a kid who hasn't gone to school for two years. Um, they have uh, the computer time, they have the cell phone. And I'm like, wait a sec, you're saying I feel totally out of control and I can't get my kid to do anything. And you've got like, almost, you know, you've got all this leverage. So a kid says, I don't want to go to therapy and they're flunking out of school, then make their life miserable. You know, I mean, you, it sort of feels to me like you can't have it both ways, you know. Um, so that's, that's what that, that just associated to that. I want to go back to that slide, though, because you all seem to be interested in it. Um, oh, the other thing I would say is um, sometimes, wait, what was I going to say? The other thing I think is sometimes and maybe this hasn't happened, you've never heard about this happening, but sometimes kids can use becoming suicidal as, like, a parent tries to set a limit, and then a kid says, well, my life is going to become so miserable, I'm going to kill myself if you do that. And I think it's really important to, to be firm. Like, if you're suicidal, we'll get you evaluated, and you can't have access to, to whatever it is. Where, one thing I would do is I'm channel, channeling Meredith Gansner, who's a colleague of mine who's done a lot of research on internet stuff. And um, sometimes what can happen is a parent can get really pissed at how much 
their kid is on the cell phone or gaming, and then they take the cell phone away. And if they haven't had a discussion about it, it can escalate and it can even get physically aggressive. So um, it's important if you're going to take the phone away to discuss about why it is that you're going to take it away before it happens and, um, and have a, sort of an agreed idea and try to make it short amounts of time because uh, unfortunately, especially in her research, there, if you look at inpatient psychiatric hospitalizations, like 15 to 20% of them would have been around trying to set a limit around social media stuff and it got, being like gasoline. So trying to kind of navigate that's really important to figure out. And there are media plans. I've never been able to do them with my patients, I have to confess. <laughs> but there are media plans through Brown where you say, you know, this is the way we're going to manage it and, and these are the controls that we're going to put on the phone. And um, it's, yeah, so. Um, so. I feel like it's 820. I don't want to, I don't, I'm only going to just show you one other quick thing. This is a really cool app that I like. Um, it's called How We Feel. And because um, <clears throat> I think a lot of, I've been really enjoying it. <laughs> I, and if you guys, uh, it, you basically, it pops up, it asks you how you feel, and they have like 75 words for, you know, you can, um, you say, whether you're feeling low energy, pleasant, high energy, pleasant, high energy, not good, and low energy. And then they have like literally like 45 different fe feeling words that you can pick out. And I think it's about, it's kind of like for younger kids you have emotional thermometers, but it's helping kids be more refined about what their feeling state is. And then the really cool thing about it is it has evidence-based one-minute videos that, I mean, it's good for adults, like stupid stuff that you guys are going to say, like, Nancy, really? You had to look at it in an app? But, like, one of them was about doing random acts of kindness and how that can really improve your mood. And, uh, you know, that, that, so they'll have very quick, short ideas about it, and you can share it. So say, for instance, your kid is like, I don't want to tell you how I'm feeling the first minute I see you, but you could see maybe they wouldn't mind, you know, sharing one of these things with, you know, uh, and you can take a picture of yourself. So selfies are involved with it. That's a cool thing. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Really. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.